Okay. All right, so my stream deck is not working. I was up at five o'clock this morning trying to get it to work. It's not working. So this whole, um, what is that out there? Oh, yeah, so, oh boy. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. All right, so I'm, uh, doing the best I can right now for all of you online people. It's sort of kind of working. We're going to try to make this work. Classroom people, you'll have no problem because I'm here live, thankfully. I don't require technology. Um, you guys, those of you who attended online, you said it was interesting. Did you have any challenges or? Main challenge I have is trying to find the book. Okay. All right. They kept taking me everywhere else, but where the, I kind of went to YouTube. Okay. Hmm. All right. I'll have to see if I can figure out a way to route it a little bit easier. Yeah, because it wasn't letting me go through the site and join that way. So I had to go to YouTube. To YouTube to watch it. Okay. All right. Okay. 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 Yeah, I did end the class early. Yep. <laughs> yeah for uh practice because i open it up for practice but i don't live stream the practice because i don't want you guys to get i want you to practice i don't want you to be self-conscious because you're on video <laughs> yeah okay that you found it helpful that's good that's good you can now if you come in here to practice i have everything available to you and you have this room available on on class days mondays and wednesdays up until four while you're enrolled and from 1 30 till four for a month after you graduate so you can come in here and practice you've got the hi you've got the mannequin you've got the supplies you got everything you need but if you can't come into practice, you know, what transportation, work schedule, children, whatever, and you need to practice at home, we do sell practice kits that has everything in it that you need um, to practice. So a bath basin, an emesis basin, a graduate container, which we're going to get into next week on Monday, a drainage bag, chucks, gate belt is in there. Um, emery board, orange stick, denture brush, tooth ets, toothbrushes, I, everything you need in a carrying bag. Um, so we do, you can go next door and purchase one of those. And the email that I'm sending out tonight actually has all the information in it for the practice kit. Because we're at the, the point now, and it, it's predictable. I've done enough of these yeah, know to know where the, yeah. So this is about the time that you guys start freaking out because, oh my gosh, we only have a week left. And that means my test is coming up and I probably ought to start practicing. So um, I've got all the information on the practice kit in there for you. And you can just go next door and buy it. But remember, if you come in here, it's all here. <laughs> all right, so did anybody have any questions on um, the homework that you did? chapter seven. Other than what we talked about, there's going to be discrepancies between what the blue book has and what I tell you, there's discrepancies. Um, so other than that, always go by me. Um, are there any other questions? 
No. Let me turn this AC off because it is going to be difficult like everything else today. I kind of thought, you know, last class it was just Monday. But no, apparently <laughs> it's me and technology. All right. So um, when I call your name, let me know how you did on chapter seven. Sandy. Okay. Do you have um, five and six for me as well? Very good. Chloe? Not here. Melissa? Okay. Can't, um, I need from you two through six. Somehow I've missed them. No, two, three, four, five, and six. So it'd be 133 and on. Okay. Very good. Okay. Okay, no problem. No worries. Denisley? Amanda? Thank you. Uh, Don? Whitney? Okay, Don. Okay. Okay, that's okay. Can I get one through six? <laughs> okay. 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 Very good. Very good. Whitney. Do you have, um, oh no, can I get those? Okay. Okay. Very good. Very good. Well, I hope that you're feeling better. Oh my gosh. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, oh, they're horrible. Horrid. Oh my gosh. Oh. Good. Oh, very good. Well, we're welcome back. All of the replays for all of the classes are up on YouTube. Get with me after class and I'll, I'll get you those replays. Um, and if you need, just let me know what you need to, to move forward. I know somebody joined, but I don't see it on here. Uh, the connection to the TV is a little bit spotty. It doesn't, um, what is it? it doesn't, like my mouse doesn't show up all the time. I don't know why. Okay. I heard beep beep, but nobody's there. All right, Karen. Okay, thank you. Uh, Caitlin, is Caitlin here? I think so. Uh, Soraya? Not here. And Valerie. All right. Does anybody um, need me to explain anything from chapter seven? No. Chapter seven is not too terribly difficult. Most of the stuff we're going over in class, um, the paragraphs in between, but there's a couple things that, you know, between six and seven that we don't cover in class, um, such as we're going to cover female peri care today, but male peri care is not on the test. So the book in chapter six talks a little bit about male peri care. Also talked about showering. I'm not going to show you how to shower here because we don't have a shower. It's not on the test either. 
uh, partial bed bath is, but not showering. But the book kind of explains the process. The biggest thing was showering because you may have a written question on it, you know, on the process. But the biggest thing to remember about showering, well, there's probably three big things. Number one, water temperature is important. And we've talked a lot about that in the class. Just because you think it's comfortable doesn't mean your patient's going to agree. Plus, they have thinner skin and less fat under the skin, so they're going to perceive the water temperature different than you. Keep that in mind. So don't have the water super hot or super cold. Um, we're going to check it. It should feel warm. And then we're going to ask the patient to check it before we put them under it. And that's kind of important. If we're helping somebody with showering, we want to do it in a way that is truly helpful, right? So I've got a, a example of this. It has nothing to do with healthcare. I um. I decided at some point to hire a house cleaner to help me because Lord knows I need the help, right? I am up to my eyeballs with this kind of stuff. So I hired a cleaning crew. And they came to the house and I kind of went over what I wanted, but I figured this is what they do for a living. They, you know, will clean. And um, they were there for like four hours and they cleaned, but it wasn't the way I wanted it cleaned. So like they didn't take up any of my rugs. They just mopped around them. So I probably should have been more specific, right? You know, can you take up the rugs before you mop around them? Um, they, yeah, they, um, you know, they cleaned the toilets and they, you know, cleaned the showers and everything, but they didn't, um, they didn't really get the, the drops off of the, the glass in my shower. And that was, kind of something I was hoping they would do, right? You know, because that's what they do, that they're, they're experts at this. So I didn't have them back and I haven't had another cleaning company since. So my one-time experience, and, they, um, and I kind of thought, well, for that amount of money, I, you know, this is stuff I do, you know? Um, so even though I hired somebody to help me, it really wasn't much help, right? And it kind of left a sour taste in my mouth. So now I'm a little bit leery about trying to get somebody else to help because there's things that I need done that I can't do. Like I want all of my cat, the fronts of my cabinets wiped down. Um, I, I just can't get to that, you know? So if I ever hire another cleaning company, I'm gonna be very detailed with what I expect of them. And I think maybe that will help with expectations. But at the end of the day, it really isn't help unless we're helping somebody the way they need to be helped. This goes with everything we do as CNAs. If we're feeding somebody, we need to feed them the way they want to eat, not the way we want to do the skill. If we're showering somebody, we need to shower them the way they need to be showered. So water temperature that's appropriate. Soap that they prefer <laughs> as long as it's available. Those types of things, right? Because help isn't help if it's not helpful. Does that make sense? So it's a good lesson for us to kind of remember that yes, we're there to do a job, but don't get so wrapped up in doing the job that you forget we're doing it with someone else, not on with. There's a difference there. Good, makes sense. So um, showering, listen to them, right? Water temperature is important. The second thing with showering that's very important is safety because we're in an environment that's wet, slips and falls can happen. So safety, pay attention to safety with showering. The third thing is maybe a little less obvious and it's privacy because 
let's face it, we're showering you. You're not going to be fully clothed when you're showering, right? So why do we have to think about privacy when it comes to showering? Well, it's still important. So where it's going to be really important is don't undress the patient in their room and then take them to the shower room. That's, you know, not cool. And we're not going to parade them through the hallway. That's actually a potential question on the state exam. Mm -hmm. So you have to ask yourself, why? Why is this question on the state exam? Ah, there it is. There it is. Yeah. So we, you know, we need to be aware that these practices sometimes exist so that we can watch ourselves so that we don't fall into those complacent um, activities. But it's also privacy. So we're going to take the patient into the room, remove their clothing, you know, in the room, minimize their um, exposure. But when we get them into the shower and then out of the shower, you want to try to cover them as quickly as possible. Number one, because it gets cold. But number two, and you're going to forget that because you are fully active in a steamy shower, fully clothed. You're going to forget that it's cold to them because you're like sweating. Um, you'll forget that. But the other part of that is you want to cover them, not just for temperature, but because you are a stranger in the room with them as well. So there's that privacy issue. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's why we call them bath blankets. That's really what they were designed. They're absorbent like a towel. They're designed to be put, you know, just draped over somebody when we're getting them out of the shower um, until we can get the towel to get, you know, all the areas dried off so that when we're drying their back, at least their front is covered. Okay, good. Makes sense. So those are the big things that I wanted to kind of talk about with, with showering. The rules are really the same when you think about it, right? We check the temperature, they check the temperature, that works for shower too, right? Minimize exposure, that works for shower too. Make sure that you're, you know, keeping them warm while they're wet, that works for shower too. So all of the things that we learned for partial bed bath apply to showers, but it's just not as obvious. So that's why I wanna go over it because you may have some written questions on it. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so we have learned all of the principles, all of them, they're done. There are no new principles to learn. So everything that we're gonna to learn today is gonna to follow what we've already learned, except for feeding. Feeding is our outlier. Feeding is different from every other skill that we do. And I'll explain why, what makes it different as we get, when we get to that skill, we're going to start with transfer, but feeding is a little bit different. Um, but everything else we're going to learn follows a principle that we've already learned before. So not a whole lot of like skill learning. Today is all about theory learning. So everything I'm going to be talking about today, although it's going to relate to the skills that we're going to do, is actually more likely to show up on the written exam. Hi. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> um, it's actually more likely to show up on the written test. Okay, so this is all information you need to do the skills, but also to keep our patients safe. So good. Any questions? Do you need me to review the principles with you this morning? Everybody good? How do we know what to do with each patient? The care plan. Well, what do we do if we can't follow the care plan? Tell the nurse. Yeah, you will have one or two questions about that as well. All right, so let's turn to page 50 in our book. And uh, today, um, you will have about an hour, maybe even a little bit more of practice time in class today. So we're only learning three skills, that's it, three skills. So it is a super easy day. Now, the three skills we're learning take me a little bit of time to teach because there's a lot of theory involved in it, but um, we're only learning three skills. And then after today, 
we only have three left. That's it. So look how easy this was. Look how far you've come. Okay, you're almost there. One week to go. Yeah, super exciting. All right. And because I don't have my little trusty little deck, we're going to do this the old fashioned way. Oh, where's my... Okay. All right, so if you look at page 50 in your book, this is the page that we have. And this is transferring a patient out of bed and into a wheelchair. If you look at the bottom, you'll see this should take, or somebody with your level experience should be able to do this skill in 11 minutes or less. We're taking somebody out of bed and putting them in a wheelchair. 11 minutes. That's a long time, guys. That is a really long time. But if you remember our shoe rules, if the patient's feet hit the floor, we got to talk about their shoes. Now, your patient is laying in bed, and I don't know about you, but I generally don't wear shoes in bed. Most people don't. So if they're laying in bed and they don't have shoes on, when we get them sitting on the side of the bed and their feet touch the floor, now we got to worry about shoes, which means in this case, we actually have to put them on. 11 minutes, guys. <laughs> That's why you've got this amount of time. Make sense? Because you have to put shoes on and that takes a little bit of time. Now, for the test, do you remember I said, let's go all the way back to day one real quick. When you go for the test, they're going to check you in and then the evaluators leave for a little bit and they're gone for like 20, 30 minutes. And when they come back, they're going to pair you up with somebody else and it's not random. You guys remember that? If you get this skill, they have to pair you up or they, they have to try to pair you up with somebody your body size or smaller. And even better if they have slip-on shoes, things that are easy to get on and off. So if um, let's say that you get um, this skill. So I, I'm looking around and I've only got a couple people that I'm gonna be put, you know, able to pair you with. So one of the things I'm gonna be looking at are shoes <laughs> along the way. And I'm remembering who has what issues because if she has a sprained ankle, right? Um, and she just got out of the hospital. <laughs> so I'm now down to you. So you guys are gonna be paired together, okay? Now, thankfully she has shoes that just kind of slip on, it looks like, yep. So, <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> yep. As long as you don't have to run anywhere. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. I've got the elastic laces that I never have to tie. Yeah. I just slip them in and yeah, those are nice. Um, so those are kind of the things that they're going to look at here. It doesn't mean that you're going to automatically be paired with somebody that you know has you may have to actually put shoes on and tie them and you know all of those things um but they're going to try to make this as easy as possible for you where they can does that make sense all right so this is another testing student if you see here at the bottom you'll see patient is student they're going to be positioned in bed so your patient's going to start out laying in bed like this, but it's not a mannequin, it's a real person. So you're gonna start out laying in bed. You're gonna pivot them around so they're sitting on the side of the bed. You're gonna put shoes on. You're gonna put a gate belt around. How do we know the gate belt is tight enough? Four fingers. Does it go on me or the patient? Oh, I got a story about that. 
so one of the evaluators was telling me this. We, we were, I don't know if I told you, we were a testing center for several years. One of the evaluators comes out and she's just shaking her head and she says, okay, I have now officially seen everything. Okay. So somebody that was testing, we were regional. So people come from all over, you know, not necessarily my students. They kind of came from everywhere. So one of the testing candidates got this skill. Okay. Transfer out of bed into a wheelchair. Can't be that hard. You could probably figure this out. I mean, just basically knowing what you know, you could probably figure this out and, and do an okay job at it. But this person apparently had not gone to any class or watched any videos and was literally trying to wing it. So she gets the gate belt and she's not sure what to do with it. So first she puts it around her waist and has the patient hold on to it. And then she thinks, well, maybe that's not right. So she takes it off and she puts it around the patient's waist. And then she isn't really sure how that's going to help anything. So she takes it off and tries to put it around both of them. <laughs> now, all I can imagine is a three-legged race, right? <laughs> so because it is not as obvious as I would think, I want to make sure that you understand the gait belt goes around the patient's waist and you are going to use that to lift the patient to a standing position. We don't want to grab at the arms. We talked about that on Monday because when you pull at the arms, you're pulling the upper body, the lower body is going to trail behind and that's where our weight is. So you're going to have to pull harder because you're not lifting at their center of gravity. Nope, nope. You want to check somewhere in the front, but because that's usually the biggest, you know, area somewhere in the front, but it doesn't, there's no, no rule for that. No rule. Um, just make sure it is snug enough. And that's something that you guys unconsciously, you're not even aware that you won't put it on tight enough because you're afraid that you're going to hurt the patient. And it's kind of universal. It's like CNAs just don't put the gate belt tight enough because they're afraid. It's not going to hurt anybody. You need it snug. And you'll figure it out the first time you go to lift a patient and their legs go to jello and they fall right through the belt and you're holding the belt. Um, so it really is super important that you get this tight enough that it's gonna stay in place because we get skinnier when we stand. Right now, if I put a belt around you and had it snug, when you stand up, your tor torso elongates and you're gonna gain about an inch, maybe even two between the belt and the patient when they stand. So getting it tight enough really is an important step. Okay, good. So we're going to use a gate belt, but this is not a hard skill. We're going to do our opening. We're going to, um, you know, close curtain, wash hands, get gate belt, all of that. We don't need a barrier because all we need is a gate belt for this. We're going to get the patient sitting on the edge of the bed, put the gate belt around, put the shoes on. Order doesn't matter. You want to put the shoes on first? That's fine. Gate belt first? That's fine. Nobody cares. You're going to bring the wheelchair close once the patient's ready. Bring the wheelchair close. We're going to lock it and we're going to transfer the patient into it using the same method we use for ambulate. We're going to count to three. We're going to stand at an oblique angle. Remember one foot in front of their feet, one foot beside. We're going to count to three and we're going to lift the patient to a standing position. Not hard. Once you get them standing, you're going to pivot because we're going to see that in the care plan in a minute. And then we're going to help them sit. But are they going to sit if they don't think there's anything behind them? They have to feel that chair. But man, that takes a long time. Lift, pivot. Can you feel the chair behind you? Yes. Let's sit. That's a long time if the patient isn't holding weight on their own. So you wanna to try to do this a little bit quicker. 
to make it quicker, I tell the patient before we stand up, before I lift them, before I try to take them anywhere, I tell them, I'm going to lift you and pivot you. When you feel that chair behind your knees, I want you to say, sit. Okay. So as soon as you feel that chair, say, sit, and I'll help you sit. And then I'll, one more time, as I reach around the gate belt, I'll say, when you feel the chair, say, sit. One, two, three, up, over, sit, down it shortens that whole arc. Good? Make sense? Okay. So let's go back a page to page 49. Oh, I'm sorry. One thing real quick. Let's read the care plan. This care plan tells us to transfer the resident from bed into the wheelchair. The resident is unable to walk or take steps but can stand with support. A gate belt or transfer belt is required to transfer the resident. And then the resident will stay in the room after transfer. We're not taking them anywhere. So a couple of big things here. It says the resident is unable to walk or take steps. That is super important, big important. Because if you don't get that wheelchair close enough, Whoever is being the patient will unconsciously take a step. What does care plan say? They can't take steps. So if you don't get that wheelchair close enough and that patient, the person playing the patient has to take a step, you didn't follow the care plan. What does that do to your score? That's right. So you have so the big thing, big point with this particular skill is make sure the wheelchair is close enough. We're going to get there in just a second. So this skill is 100% about breaks. All breaks. So you can see the wheelchair here. This is the brake mechanism. This lever is what controls the brakes. So if you see the levers in the upright position, now it's in the forward position. That's what controls this bar. Okay, with and wheelchairs, half of them, you push forward to engage the brakes. The other half, you pull back to engage the brakes. They're different. There's all, in fact, the two wheelchairs I have here, it's one of each. But the whole purpose is this bar has to bite into the wheel to stop it from rolling. That's how brakes work on a wheelchair. So during the test, if you get this skill, if this is one of the skills you have to do, they're gonna show you how to use the wheelchair at the center. They're gonna say you push forward for brakes here, or on this wheelchair, you pull back to engage the brakes. So they're gonna show you how it works, but for your own knowledge, you should verify and just see, do I push this lever forward to get that uh, bar to bite into the, the wheel or pull it back. Just know how it works, okay? So when in doubt, brakes should be on. Basically, the only time that the brakes should not be engaged on a wheelchair is when it is physically moving. If the wheelchair is physically in motion, the brakes don't need to be applied. All other times, they do. So wheelchairs are usually kept in the folded position for storage, just keeps them a little bit smaller, makes them a little bit more convenient to store. To open a wheelchair, can you see? To open a wheelchair, you want to get the big wheels up off the floor because that's friction. So I lift up on these handles just a little bit to get the big wheels off the floor and you pull it apart. It's mechanical. There's no button to push. There's no remote control, nothing like that. Just pick it up and pull it apart. If it doesn't open all the way, and not all of them do, this is a very easy to open wheelchair. That one is not. 
But if it doesn't open up all the way and you end up with something like this, it's kind of sad looking. To get it to open the rest of the way, you want to press down on these bars. These bars. Don't put your hands though down beside because as this thing expands, that gap gets smaller and you'll pinch your hands. So to press down on these bars, you want to keep the, the outside of your hands out of the way. So you're going to press down like that. Mm, yeah, it, it will pinch you. Now, something else. Okay. One second here. I need to get. Okay, guys, that's about as good. Yeah, see, it's still pretty. All right, guys, I can't get it any further down. Sorry. Okay, I can't get the camera any further down, but something that's important to note when it comes to wheelchairs, do you see how much higher the wheelchair seat is from a regular seat? That's on purpose because wheelchairs are designed to get somebody from point A to B. In a regular chair, we want your feet flat on the floor so your legs are supported. A wheelchair, we don't want your feet flat on the floor because we're trying to take you somewhere. Wheelchairs are a little bit higher. Now, most people don't really think that, you know, think about this, but this poses a problem because that means with the seat higher, the legs are gonna dangle. And when you have legs that dangle, this part of the seat presses up into the backs of the knees and that's where all your veins are. So the blood that's returning from your legs are going up to, you know, your, your torso back to your heart has to go through those, the backs of the knees, those veins in the backs of the knees. Well, if we squish those down by having the legs dangle, blood's not going to be able to get back to the heart very well. So we end up with a lot of blood in the legs. So we get swelling. Do you guys remember when we talked about blood pressure? I said, anytime blood slows or stops, anybody remember what it does? It clots. So by having somebody's legs dangle for a long period of time, the conditions are right if they're prone to clotting for clotting to occur. Does that make sense? Good. All right. So when we have a patient in a wheelchair, we need to understand the legs will dangle. So the best thing for us to do is to get the foot pedals in place to give their feet somewhere to rest that relieves the pressure from behind the knees and allows the blood to circulate effectively. So the foot pedals are actually a very important part of a wheelchair. Now I'm sure some of you have seen the lower wheelchairs that have no leg rests and they usually don't have big wheels. They have four small wheels. Those are called companion chairs and they're specifically designed for the people that just kind of pad around, right? They use their feet to kind of get everywhere they need to go. They shuffle. Those are called companion chairs and they're low. So the feet do touch the ground, which allows the patient to kind of move around as they wish. Those are different than wheelchairs. They look similar, but they are different. Okay, good. So the way that these um, leg rests and foot pedals work is they snap in place. You just bring them forward and you can hear them snap. And then the foot pedals fold down. And now my my wheelchair is ready for the patient's feet to rest on those foot pedals to relieve the um, congestion at the back of the legs. But you can't get a patient into a wheelchair like this. Can't get them out of a wheelchair like this either because I will trip. I trip over air. You put an obstacle like this in my way and I'm guaranteed to go flat on my face. 
So we've got to get these things out of the way before we get somebody into or out of the wheelchair. To do that, we're gonna fold these foot pedals up. So those of you at home, these foot pedals fold up, but now these leg rests, they're kind of locked in place. They don't move, they're, they're, you heard them click into place. So in order to get those foot pedals out of the way, there's a little catch back here on the back of the, um, the leg rest, you just, Bring that catch, the end of it forward, and it allows those to swing out of the way. So right here, for those of you at home, right here, this catch, the back of the catch, you just bring to the middle of the wheelchair, just bring that lever in, and they'll swing out of the way. Good? Questions? Okay, wheelchairs have to be locked. We talked about that, unless they're in motion. If you try to put a patient into a wheelchair and it's not locked, it's gonna roll away. If you try to take a patient out of a wheelchair, it's not locked, it's gonna roll away. But wheelchairs with people in them often roll away as well because floors are rarely level, especially in Florida. Concrete tends to um, break in the middle because of the weight. If you take flooring up and look at a concrete floor, a lot of times it has cracks in it. That will, the weight of whatever building is on that foundation cracks it. And now we have an unlevel surface. What do you think happens if a patient is on an unlevel surface in a wheelchair? Yeah, and what's gonna stop them? Probably not. Well, if they're not locked, they're nothing. Yeah, what, yeah. If we have a rolling wheelchair, what, what would stop that rolling wheelchair? Yeah, that's right. Whatever it is that they bang into. <laughs> yeah, so another patient, a wall. Yeah, so that's a problem. We have to be aware that that's a problem. <laughs> So when we walk away from a wheelchair, it has to be locked, especially if there's a patient in it. One of the biggest um, lawsuits, healthcare related lawsuit in Florida was about a woman that was in a wheelchair. She was physically incapacitated, could not move, but mentally aware. And the wheelchair started rolling and it rolled down concrete steps. Can you imagine the terror? Can you imagine? So this is, uh, this is serious. And I spent a lot of time on this because there's a lot of resources online that are going to tell you when you lock a wheelchair, it's considered a restraint. That is untrue. Be very careful. So there's lots of practice questions, practice tests online, and you guys are probably getting nervous enough that you're starting to find some of them. Okay, so there's lots of CNA practice tests online. Some of them are free, some of them charge, but it's important to think about who's writing those questions. Are you sure that they know the testing standards? How do you know? And the problem is that this question shows up on a lot of those tests. And if you answer it, you know, and get it wrong, you're gonna think, oh my gosh, wheelchairs, the brakes are a restraint. I can't put the brakes on. And when you go into the test and demonstrate it, if you don't put the brakes on, it's a fail. So remember that the practice tests that you see online were written by somebody who is making money. They may, they may not, but unless you know their credentials and, and they don't tell you who's writing the questions, unless you know their credentials, be really careful because here's the thing that you don't really know or understand about that. If they're putting a website together to make money, which is usually why people put websites together to make money. If they give you a test that you fail, 
That's going to make you doubt yourself, which means that you're probably going to take more tests, which keeps you on their site longer, more ads. So it doesn't do them any good to give you a test that you're going to pass. Right. Right, right. Yeah, so you really have to be careful about the the <laughs> the resources that you use. I'm not saying that they're bad and, and don't get me wrong. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. I've been through a couple of, of the um, practice tests that are out there and not all of them, of course, but I, I've done, you know, kind of spot checked a few of them and, and I actually kept track of it. And this is probably about five or six years ago, but about roughly, and it's pretty consistent, but about roughly 25 to 30 percent of the questions are not CNA domain questions. So they took them from nursing textbooks and um, phlebotomy questions. We don't do we don't stick anything anywhere as CNAs, right? We don't do invasive. So why would that question be? And again, it's designed to trigger that. You know, oh my gosh, I don't know what I need to know, and uh, it, so be be careful. No. Right. Right. We keep them clean. No. Now you can be trained to do additional tasks. We talked about that a little bit with delegation, right? You can be trained to do additional tasks depending on what your workplace needs from you. But that um, training has to be training, you know, not here, watch a YouTube video and then go practice. It needs to be training. Okay. Training doesn't have to be in the classroom. It can be at the bedside, but there does need to be training involved. Um, but that is not a out of the box CNA task. Um, and yes, there are questions on some of those practice tests about sterile technique and we don't do sterile tech. It's not, I tell you what, sterile technique is one of those hot button issues for me. Nurses have a hard time with sterile technique. Nurses. I don't think that CNAs, I don't think that that's a task that CNAs should be tackling. It's very, 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 very hard to maintain sterile. I'm talking very hard. And you tend to, and you guys are starting to think along these lines, right? Clean and dirty. You know, what if my uh, gloves touched before I touched the patient? What if my dirty gloves touched after, right? You're thinking along those lines, which is good. You need to have that awareness. But crossing over into sterile territory, that's a whole new ball game. And uh, catheter insertion is a sterile technique. 
So uh, a lot of um, states do not allow CNAs to do anything that requires sterile technique. And I'm okay with that. Some states do allow it as long as the nurse has trained you and they feel comfortable and they've evaluated you and all of that. Absolutely. The nurse is the one that's liable. Even though you're doing the task, it's my liability. <laughs> I, I don't I don't give up my liability very easy. All right. So um, the way the wheelchair works is that we're going to bring it close to us. Not too close, though. We're going to bring it close to the bed. We're going to get those foot pedals up, those leg rests out of the way, and we're just going to kind of leave it there near the bed for a few minutes. We're going to get the patient sitting on the side of the bed, get their shoes on, gate belt on, the order that doesn't matter, knock yourself out, nobody cares. You're going to bring the wheelchair in position then and lock it. Now, when I say in position, I mean this wheelchair should be touching the bed. Remember, your patient cannot take steps. So I'm going to lift this patient to a standing position, turn them, and sit them down in that wheelchair. It needs to be, it actually needs to be a little closer than this. It needs to be touching the bed and pretty much touching the patient. I mean, it's got to be right there. Because if you go back to that um, skills page for a second, It says um, they can take, they uh, can't, unable to walk or take steps, but can stand with support. Now, this care plan used to say pivot transfer. I mean, that term was in there pivot transfer. So I always want to bring up that friends meme pivot, pivot. So, um, but it did say pivot. It, it, it no longer says that anymore, I think, because of friends. Um, but, but when we, uh, but, um, but when we look at this graphic, you've got the, the patient sitting on the edge of the bed, shoes are on, gate belts in place. We're going to lift, turn and sit down. It's got to be close. That's the number one mistake that CNAs or that candidates make during the test is not having that wheelchair close enough. Number one mistake. And then the person has to take a step unconsciously. So that's why I talk about this a lot. Get it close. When you think it's too close, inch a little closer. Don't be afraid to get too close. Okay. All right. This thing eats batteries. Yeah, like I think that last set lasted a week. Okay. So let me see here. You got slip on shoes. I'm going to take you. Can you get in bed for me, please? Take your shoes off, if you would. And just leave them by the side of the bed. Lay down, if you would, please. Okay. So those of you at home, oh, you know what? Hold on a minute. I have the overhead, overbed camera. Yay. All right. <laughs> okay, those of you at home, you'll be able to see this. Yes, he came in and fixed the camera this morning. Yay. Okay, so 
whether I was doing this on that side of the bed or this side is really going to depend on how much room I've got. It's gonna be hard for me to go wheelchair over there. I've got a little bit more room over here. So I would work on this side of the bed, but it does depend if my patient has a weak side, that's going to depend on how I position. Yeah, when you're transferring, you want them to be able to put their weight on the stronger side. So when you think about the mechanics of that, right? So if I need to transfer somebody into a wheelchair and I want them to support their weight on the stronger side, then I want to make sure the stronger side is kind of, yeah, closest to the wheelchair or furthest from the bed. Does that make sense? Okay. So you kind of have to think about those things as you're um, positioning the wheelchair. For this skill in here, I'm going to use this side of the bed just because it's I've got the most space. So before I start the skill, I want the wheelchair close, but not too close. Because remember, I got to get her sitting on the side of the bed. I got to get the wheel, uh, the gate belt on. I got to get the shoes on. I got a lot of stuff to do. If that wheelchair is too close, it's going to be in my way. So for the test, the wheelchair may be in the closed position. It may be in the open position. If it's closed, you just pull it apart to open it. And you can do all that before you're opening. It's okay to do before you're opening, okay? I'm gonna leave it closed for, well, let me open it. There we go. I don't want it in my way. I've got limited room over here. All right, here we go. Hi, Ms. Jones, my name is Patty. I'm your CNA today, how are you? Good morning. Um, you feel like getting up and into a wheelchair? Sure, thank you. Okay. Oops. Nope, nope, just, <laughs> just relax for a second. Um, I'm gonna close your curtain, go wash my hands, get my supplies and I'll be right back, okay? Okay, so my curtain is closed. I have washed my hands and I'm going to get the gate belt. Now, if you want to use the overbed table, you can. There's no problem with that. You can lay it on the side of the bed. I'm just gonna put it in the wheelchair. This doesn't have to stay any. No, because it goes over clothing. It's like chairs, you sit on chairs with clothing, right? Because your clothing is your barrier. All right, Ms. Jones, I'm gonna help you sit on the edge of the bed. So I'm gonna pivot you around. But before we do that, I want you to scoot your whole body toward me. Now I'm gonna use the bed as leverage to pivot her around. So I really wanna make sure this bed is locked before or I lean against it because I'm going to use it for leverage. So if I just lean against this bed and it's not locked, we're both going that way. So we're locked. Okay, I'm going to do the pivot. You can just relax. I need you to put your arms across your chest though. This arm's going to go all the way under your shoulders. I'm going to hold that further shoulder. This one goes over your knees. Now, over the knees is important. Everybody tries to do this. This doesn't work over the knees and that's just a smooth pivot. So to do this, I'm gonna get a nice wide base of support and I'm gonna lean against the bed. I'm gonna put my hand under your shoulders and over your knees and on the count of three, we're gonna turn one, just relax. One, two, three. Oh. Good? Good. <laughs> relax. Now she did not help me with that. It actually makes it harder if she tries to help, okay? It's just a smooth pivot. And it's you, you'll surprise yourself what you can do. But the key is to get under the shoulders, as far under the shoulder as I can get, and over the knees. If you try to go under the knees, I'm pushing and pulling at the same time, and that's gonna hurt my back. Okay, so are you are you okay on the bed? Okay, there you go. Okay, let me get you to put your shoes on. And are your feet flat on the floor? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm going to put this gate belt on. This is going to go around your waist. 
I'm going to put it through the first guard by the alligator teeth, and we're going to make it snug. Four fingers through the second guard, and then tuck it in. Okay. So now I've got her sitting on the bed, shoes on, gate belt on, and I'm going to get this wheelchair in position. This is hard to do with that table right there. Thank you. Okay. So remember I said close? Can you guys see how close that is? Yeah, it's touching the bed and it's almost touching the patient about a half an inch away. So now I'm going to lock it in place. Bring your feet together for me. Okay, you're going to put your hands on my shoulder and I'm going to hold the gate belt. And on the count of three, we're going to stand and turn. When you feel that chair behind you, I want you to say sit and I'll help you sit. Okay, so stand, turn. You're going to say sit and we'll sit. Okay, so one foot in front of her feet, one foot beside her body, same stance as we had with Ambulate. Put your hands up here. Okay, remember, stand, turn, you're gonna feel the chair and say sit. Ready? One, two, three, sit. Very good. So now I can remove the gate belt because we don't need it anymore. Can you lift your arms up for me? Thank you. Okay, and now I need to get those foot pedals in place, but she's right up next to the bed. So I can't swing that foot pedal out. So I'm going to unlock the wheelchair, lift your feet up for me, and we're gonna turn around. Okay. We'll lock that wheelchair. I'm gonna lift the foot and put it on the foot pedal. I'm gonna come around to this side, lock the wheelchair, lift the foot and put it on the foot pedal. Are you comfortable? Yes, Okay. You don't want to leave the patient facing a wall because that's just boring. So here's your call light. If you need anything at all, let me know. <laughs> I'm going to open the curtain. My environment is not clean because I have a gate belt. Remember, look around and actually look to see. So we're going to put that gate belt away. Everything looks good. I did my closing. I have clean hands. I'll go back and read that care plan one more time and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. Good. Thank you. Careful. Okay, any questions? Questions on that? The important part of this skill, brakes, get the uh, wheelchair close enough and make sure that they don't take steps. Those are the three main things for this skill. All right. Bring this back around where you can see me. All right, so now we're going to go to page 75 of the skills book. This is skill number two for today.
Okay. All right. So this is our care plan. And like I said, this skill is different from every other skill that we've, we've done. This is completely different. Um, so feeding a resident who's in a chair. This care plan says feed a resident a snack. That's important, snack, who is unable to feed him or herself. The resident is sitting in a chair in an inappropriate position for eating. Underline that inappropriate. And then it tells us to document the intake on a food and fluid intake form. And you can see that right here in the middle of the screen, the food and fluid intake form. You can also see this on page 122 of your skills book. I'm sorry, 121, sorry about that, 121. So it's a, a bigger version of this care plan. But if you look at the bottom, you'll see that this should take somebody with your level of experience nine minutes or less. We're feeding somebody a snack. I have fed babies in less time than that. Okay, this is not, you've got all the time in the world you need for this. We're feeding somebody a snack. Now, for the purposes of the test, snack means pudding cup or applesauce cup. And if you're the patient for this, so let's say that you are picked to be a patient, she's going to feed you, you're going to get some very specific instructions. First of all, be you. Eat like you eat. The second thing that they're going to tell you is when you sit down in the chair, I want you to slouch or slump don't sit upright. The third thing they're going to tell you is only take four bites and then tell them you don't want any more. You're done. So be pleasant, cooperative, be you, eat like you eat, slouch or slump, and only take four bites. Okay. So the care plan tells us to feed somebody a snack, but you're only giving them four bites. And they're giving you nine minutes to do that. You've got all the time in the world. Don't rush. Because that actually is part of what's being graded. If you rush, the patient's going to feel uncomfortable. They're going to feel like they're an inconvenience. And they're not going to eat very well at all. So you're graded on how welcome you make the patient feel. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, for those of you who have, it's funny, my husband and I were just talking about this today. For those of you who have texture issues um, and you don't like applesauce or you don't like pudding, right? Um, if you can choke down four bites, please do. Please do. If you have an allergy to milk, you need to let them know. Does that make that there's a difference there? I don't want anybody breaking out in hives and stopping breathing because they're trying to be cooperative. But if you just don't really like applesauce all that much, but you could choke down a couple bites, <laughs> that would be optimal. Good? Makes sense? This is one of those things that nobody wants to be a patient for. Um, and, and they have a lot of people that like will make stuff up not to be a patient for this. And there's a, a psychological reason for that that we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. But let me explain to you why this is different from our other uh, rules. So we're going to read the care plan. That doesn't change. That never changes. The care plan is the care plan. We're going to read that care plan. Um, but during the opening, we do not close the privacy curtain. Come on. I'm about to turn that off. We do not close the privacy curtain. 
that's because eating is a social event. People gather in groups to eat. Think about every major lifetime milestone, birthday parties, there's always food there. Baby showers, there's always food there. Weddings, people go to weddings for the food and dancing, of course. But um, yeah, there's food there. Graduations, food. Yeah, but just social barbecues, yeah. So socialization is an important part of eating. And no, we don't talk with our mouth full, but we do talk while we're eating. If you walked into Chili's after lunch today, oh, let's go to Cody's, I'm sorry. They have two for one uh, fajitas on Wednesday. Yeah, so let's go to Cody's. So if we all go to Cody's after class today and we walk in, and there's about 60 people in there and it's dead silent. How awkward would that feel, right? So those people are there to eat. They're not there to bowl, right? <laughs> They're there specifically to eat. And yet the place is kind of rowdy. It's loud. People are talking, having conversations because conversation is part of eating they go together. Now you need to remember that because that is a graded checkpoint. We are graded on conversations for this skill. Every other skill, you can get away with saying, I'm gonna lift your arm above your head like you're asking a question. <laughs> you, you're gonna kind of talk out the steps so they know what you're doing, but not with feeding. You're not gonna say, I'm gonna put a little stuff on the spoon and bring it to your mouth. We're not, that is weird, awkward. They know what you're doing. Don't do that. So it's a little bit different in what we say. Our conversations are different with the patient. And your conversation is graded. Graded. Now, it doesn't have to be real. You can make something up. But you have to have a conversation. So you can say something like, they're showing a movie on the big screen later, would you like to go? Or did you know we're having the little kids in this year for the trick or treating? Oh, they were adorable last year. We had this little bumblebee. I'm having a, con it, it's not real. That did not happen. It, but for the test, I'm having a conversation. Right. Yeah, would you like to go play bingo later today? I heard the jackpot's up to $2.10. Yeah, that's that's fine too. So, But you have to have a conversation of some sort. Doesn't have to be real for the test. You can make something up, but you do have to have a conversation. Now, one of the things that I like to ask, people don't put their deepest, darkest secrets on the walls. They don't. People put things on the walls that they're willing to talk about. Like for instance, well, you can't see it because the banner here. I've got a picture of me and my husband on a cruise. Over, It's behind the banner, but I've got it out. And I am, you know, if somebody pointed to that and says, oh my gosh, do you like to cruise? Man, I, I'll talk about it. Because yes, I like to cruise. Um, that is not a deep, dark secret. <laughs> I am perfectly happy talking about it, which is why it's on display. So in your patient's environment, whatever's on display is something that they are willing to talk about. So I look around for pictures. Now in most, especially long-term care, in long-term care, most rooms have a picture, black and white, of a man in a military uniform and a drop dead gorgeous woman that's all put together. And I'll point to that picture and I'll say, oh my gosh, look at them. They look like movie stars. Did you know them? And watch her sit up a little bit straighter and say, oh honey, that's me. <laughs> wow. These ladies knew how to put themselves together in a way that I'll never, ever, ever be able to accomplish. I'm happy if I'm dressed in the morning, right? I, I don't have that ability, but man, they did. And, uh, you know, I love to talk about it. Wow. Oh, he's so handsome. Where'd you meet him? 
you know, and that opens up a whole avenue of topics that we can talk about. If there isn't anything on display, um, I have a couple of questions that I generally ask. And I'll, this is probably the most interesting one for me, the most surprising. Now, I've met somebody who was knighted by the Queen of England. That's pretty cool, right? I've met an engineer on the Apollo mission. That's pretty cool. So I've, I've met some really cool people, and you wouldn't know it. Like, they aren't wearing a billboard, you know. Y you find out by having conversations. But the most interesting one I've had, the most interesting conversation, was with a woman who didn't think she had anything to offer. This was up in Citrus County and I was doing wound care on the legs. She had horrible open ulcers on her legs from venous insufficiency. And this is a very, very long dressing change. I mean, like 40 minutes to take the old dressings off, clean, put the new dressings on and compression dressing. This is a long. So I'm pulling up a chair, right? We're gonna be here for a while. So I ask her a question I ask everybody. So Miss Mabel, What's the most exciting place you've ever been? It's a great question. Because people have taken usually multiple trips throughout their life and they'll kind of sort through them in their, their mind, right? Gives you a lot of opportunity. This lady said, now bear in mind, this is Citrus County. And she was in her late 90s, okay? So her response to me was, oh, I've never been anywhere. Oh, so you've never been out of Florida? She says, no, I've never been out of Citrus County. What? You've, lived, you've never been to Ocala? She says, no, no. And then she thought, she says, well, that's not entirely true because I was born in Brooksville, but I don't remember that. Oh my gosh. So where did you honeymoon? Oh, my aunt had a cabin in Floral City. It was a wonderful week. She just lit up. Wow. So let me get this straight. You have been in Citrus County, never left for 90 something years. She says, yeah, that's right. I says, oh my gosh, this is gonna be awesome because I get to learn about this county in a way that cannot be captured in a textbook. So I got, I mean, here's somebody who thought she had absolutely no conversation ability here. And I found out about the two warring families in Inverness and how the son and daughter were supposed to get married to kind of unite the families. And the daughter ran off with another guy. <laughs> and it was a scandal <laughs> when the courthouse was rebuilt. That was a really big deal, a lot of controversy. When the first paved road went into Citrus County, the first paved road, the first McDonald's, the first car dealership, she was there for all of it. I was there way longer than 40 minutes. <laughs> So it's amazing the conversations you can have with people if you just open the conversation. Does that make sense? The one I always asked when I was doing it was, how's your family today? Because then that opens up so many opportunities because then you learn about their family, where they came from, how they've done what they did, how yep. they got. Um, so I always try to ask, but you do get the ones, well, I don't have children. Mm -hmm. Well, who's your favorite uh, niece or nephew? Right. You spend a lot of time with them. I mean, yep. you can take it, and it's a simple question. Sure. Your family? Absolutely. <laughs> people, yeah, people are more comfortable talking about themselves when they're given an opening. People tend to clam up if they don't know what to say. But you know, your family, your trips, your uh, experiences, those are all things that people are usually pretty willing to talk about. 
So it's, it's good to have some of these questions like, how's your family today? Or what's the most exciting place you've ever been? Or, um, you know, where, so how did you end up in Florida? I, I use that one a lot because hardly anybody is from here. I am. I, yeah, I was, I was born in Florida. I've lived here all of my life, but very few people fit that. Now I know that Florida people have children, right? (laughs) But they don't stay here for some reason. They go somewhere else. Um, There's very few people that are here because they were born here. And if they were, oh, that's an awesome, you know, how much has Florida changed? So that can go in either direction. So where are you from? You know, what was life like? How did you end up here? You know, all of those things. Or if they are from here, wow, where did you grow up? You know, what what kind of changes have you seen? You know, that type of thing. So you've got lots of conversation opportunities, but conversation is the name of the game here. Get to know your patients. Eating is very intimate. So you don't want to be at arm's length with your patient. It's an intimate skill. It needs to have a more intimate conversation. Okay. Connections. Does that make sense? Um, Along those lines, it's important to understand that patients that have to be fed don't eat very well. They don't. There's a psychological part of this skill that we don't really stop and think about, but eating is the very first skill you become independent at, the very first one. You learn how to hold your bottle before you understand what hungry is. You pick up Cheerios and diced peaches off a high chair tray before you master sitting. We prop you up, but you manage to get stuff to your mouth, right? So eating is the first skill you develop. When you lose the ability to feed yourself, it affects you psychologically in a way that no other skill does. And it's important to understand that. Patients that have to be fed have a high rate of malnutrition, of depression, of failure to thrive, because it produces a dependency on others that is different than other dependencies. Does that make sense? It's perceived by patients differently. And you'll hear it all the time. I don't want to be a bother. I don't want to be an inconvenience. Go do something, you know, go feed somebody else that needs it more. They try to minimize their dependence on others when it comes to feeding. So if you're aware of that and you're using conversation effectively, you can overcome a lot of those obstacles by getting them involved in the conversation and they will eat without being self-conscious or aware that they're eating. You're distracting their mind away another way instead of what they're self-conscious about. Right, exactly. So that's why conversation is so important for this skill. It's not, you know, when you're feeding somebody at home and and you're kind of playing around, learning the skill, practicing that type of thing, and you're getting a bowl of ice cream and feeding a significant other or whatever, that's, that's just kind of playing around, right? That, that you're not going to have those same restrictions. When you feed somebody that legitimately cannot feed themselves, it's different. It is way different. Right. Right. Absolutely. There is a, a, we really are what we eat. I mean, a hundred percent, we are what we eat. Um, and as we age, things that we used to enjoy, maybe we don't enjoy as much anymore, or we may not be able to tolerate much. 
for me, as I age, it's onions. Now, I like onions, right? Uh, you know, you saute them and you, you know, I am, as I age, developing an intolerant, and I am sad about this. I am sad, but my body is changing because I'm aging. Now I can imagine, you know, add 30 years on to me and I probably am not going to be able to enjoy onions in any form anymore, you know, so meatloaf is going to change because I like onions in my meatloaf. Um, so by having conversations, you know, you've got this plate and they may say, oh no, I don't want that meatloaf because those onions are really going to tear me up later. Well, that's something that you could report to the, the nurse, okay, conversation. Um, sometimes, well, let, let me back up. Patients are going to eat different than you do. They, they are. Um, we don't really pay much attention to this, but everybody has different eating idiosyncrasies. Everybody. Like my husband will eat all of one thing on his plate before going to a next. Like he, he actually, like he'll eat all of his spaghetti before his green beans. Um, I'm kind of a grazer. I'll eat a little this, a little that, a little this, right? Kind of move around my plate. Um, some people don't like their foods to touch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't let anything overlap on the plate. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. I saw a Thanksgiving plate for people that don't like their stuff to touch. It looks like a wagon wheel. Yeah. 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 Um, some people eat their salad before a meal. Some people eat their salad after the meal. Some people eat dessert first because life is short. Some people eat dessert last if they have room. Um, some people um, like corn and mashed potatoes mixed. Some people are like, Oh no, <laughs> it does not work for me. So we need to understand that we don't really think about the, that. We, we just think about the way we like to eat. Like I do not like fries and frosties, not for me. If you take a fry and dip it in ice cream, that is just not right. Yeah. But yes, yes, my daughter, that is a delicacy, you know? So understand that people have different preferences don't assume that the way you eat is the way they're going to eat and sometimes cnas will do this if you're a corn and mashed potato mixer you'll just automatically mix corn and mashed potatoes together but if you are eating a or feeding a person that does not eat stuff mixed they're not going to eat it so we have to be aware of these idiosyncrasies. And this, like I said, isn't something that we often think about, right? Well, we want to ask the patient, what do you want to eat first? Or what would you like next? Don't feed them the way you eat. Don't just assume they're going to eat all of their spaghetti first before going to their green beans. We need to have their input with this. So that's going to be kind of worked into the conversation as well. As you get to know your patients, you'll start to learn their eating habits, and then you won't have to ask as much, but don't make the mistake of not asking. Um, for the test, we're only feeding somebody a snack, one item. There's just pudding or applesauce. One, So we don't have to ask for the test, but you need to be aware of it because that may show up on the written test. Okay, so good questions. All right. Sometimes patients that are particularly reticent to or uh, resistant to being fed, sometimes if we kind of make it seem like they're helping us, it can help. Like we had this one lady, she was losing weight. I mean, she was losing weight. I that AC. So, um, you know, and as a, a nurse, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, do we have, you know, some sort of a cancer going on or do we maybe have a um, digestive issue that needs to be treated or, you know, I mean, you know, the, the sky's the limit. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things that can be going on with this patient. 
And uh, I asked the CNA that was feeding her, how is she doing, you know, when you're feeding her? She's like, oh, she's not really wanting to eat, uh, you know, no appetite. She'll only take a couple bites and then she tells me to stop and go away. So I said, are you encouraging her? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I encourage her. Yeah. yeah. So I walked by the room one day when the patient was being fed. And, and that's the other thing. The patient did not go to the dining room. People that stay in their rooms don't eat well. They're isolated. Yeah. So this is why we don't close the privacy curtain because it isolates the patient. So if they have to be in the room, the curtain should be open so they can at least interact with others visually. So I walked by and the CNA is standing at the side of the bed watching TV, feeding the patient. Well, now I know why the patient's not eating. They feel like they're an inconvenience. So I walked in and told the CNA, hey, go take care of, you know, somebody else. It just basically got the CNA out of the room. And I pulled up a chair and sat down and I said, Miss Mary, I get to feed you today and I cannot wait because my feet are killing me and I just need to sit here for a few minutes. So can you eat slow for me? <laughs> and she kind of grinned and she took a bite and she chewed. And I started talking and, you know, after a few bites, she's like, no, I'm done. I'm like, oh, Miss Mary, come on. I'm not ready to get up yet. I'm tired. Let me sit for a few more minutes. Come on, just a couple, couple more bites. Got a few more bites into her. Before she knew it, she had eaten almost the entire meal because she thought she was doing me a favor. So sometimes if you can kind of frame it, especially with your patients that are, are particularly troublesome, you know, that they don't, don't have an appetite, don't want to eat, they seem really withdrawn. If you kind of phrase it in that way and get them, you know, you can get them to cooperate by helping you. Okay. Yeah, a little bit of reverse psychology there. Yeah. Um, but sure enough, I mean, she using those techniques. I also um, made it a point to get her to the dining room at least once a day because people tend to eat better in groups, socialization, but it's also that mimicry. You see people eating, you tend to eat yourself. Like when I'm on a diet, I can't watch people eat because I want to eat, <laughs> you know? So mimicry has a huge impact on this. Good, makes sense. So are you saying why feeding is so different from other skills? So we don't close the privacy curtain. We have to sit at eye level so the patient doesn't feel rushed or they don't feel like they're an imposition. You have to have a conversation with them. You're graded on it, but it also helps them eat. You have to ask what they want next, because that's important. We don't feed them the way we want to eat. Um, and we're not going to use a barrier for this one because the food tray is our barrier. So no barrier on the table. So a lot of our rules just simply don't apply here. We don't even have to clean the food tray after because it goes to the, the kitchen. So a lot of the things that we're used to doing, we just don't have to do for this particular skill. So at the beginning of the skill, if you're the patient, you're going to be told to slouch or slump. And that care plan that we looked at a few minutes ago actually says the patient is in an inappropriate position for eating. Now, I'm going to tell you out there in clinical world, no care plan is ever going to say that. No care plan anywhere ever is going to say that. They're relying on you to actually see it. So you need to pay attention, but because it's on the care plan, if you don't address it, it's an automatic fail. Yes. Yep. Yeah, no, you can, what they're, uh, what they're assessing here is whether you address it. So you can just ask the patient, can you please sit up straight? Yeah. We don't have to do anything. We can just address it. Okay. 
Now, at the beginning of this skill, we are going to offer the patient a hand wipe. There's two reasons for this. Even though I'm feeding the patient, I really need them to have clean hands. Number one is part of ritual. Most people wash their hands before they eat. It's part of the eating ritual. So it, it kind of helps stimulate the appetite. But number two, the other reason is just because I'm feeding them doesn't mean that they're paralyzed. Their fingers may find their way to their face to wipe off a drop of something or redirect food into their mouth or something like that. And I do not want dirty hands up near the face. So giving them a hand wipe at the beginning, even though I'm feeding them, is an important infection control measure. Good? Okay. We're also going to offer a clothing protector. They don't have to wear one. We don't call it a bib. We don't call it a bib. <laughs> clothing protector. We're going to offer it. it. You know, you can use a towel. That's fine. But we're going to offer a clothing protector. Me, I need, I, I need a clothing protector now because everything I eat goes right on the front of me all the time. Um, in fact, I think I'm wearing some from this morning, actually. So I would probably say yes. Now, my grandmother, oh, no. <laughs> That's a dignity thing, and she doesn't need something like that. So everybody's going to handle that a little bit differently. All we're going to do is offer. Um, we don't use childlike feeding techniques, no planes, trains, or race cars. Now I'm going to tell you, so that's for the test. We don't use childlike feeding techniques. And as a general rule, it's not a good idea. But you will have patients now and then that you connect with. And I use a lot of humor in my nursing. It's a good way to connect with people and it kind of cuts the tension. So yes, I have been known to use airplanes or race cars on occasion to get a smile. People tend to eat better when they're in a good mood. So you will figure out in your practice who you can kind of play around with, who you've connected with. But a first time, first time I'm feeding somebody, I no way. I don't know who they are or how they're going to react or, you know, if I offend them by treating them like a, I'm already feeding them, right? They feel very inferior at that. If I'm treating them as a child during that, it can be degrading, and it can it it, it can um, affect their. If I offend them, they're not going to eat. Right. Does that make sense? So for the test, no childlike feeding techniques. As a general rule, not a good idea. But in your practice, you may encounter that from time to time. Um, any questions on what we've gone over so far? So everything that we've talked about is on page 73 and 74. I'm sorry. 72 and 73, 72 and 73. Now I told you that earlier, I told you that you're, if you're the patient for this, you're only gonna be taking four bites. So if you're the patient, you get the instruction, you only take four bites. And that really has to do with liquids, not food, because we're gonna offer a drink before they eat and every two or three bites as we feed them. So if we get to bite four and you didn't offer a drink, you're not offering it often enough. Most older patients, the thirst reflex um, is diminished as we age. You don't get as thirsty, you don't recognize thirst. A lot of older people are dehydrated because of that. So every time you see an elderly person, you should be offering a drink. As long as they're not on fluid restrictions, we need to be encouraging drinks. And sometimes a lot of them may not want to drink often because they may have to go to the bathroom. Yes. Some of their liquids and things like that. That is very true. They, they reduce their liquid intake to reduce bathroom trips. And that dehydrates them. Um, so we have to be um, encouraging. So for the test, they're grading you on offering before you start feeding. They don't have to take it. 
They may say no, that's fine. And you're going to offer every two or three bites. Again, they don't have to take it. They can say no, that's fine. But you, the one that's been graded, have to offer before and every two to three bites. So by the time they get to bite four, once they've taken bite four, the person playing the patient is going to refuse to eat anymore. They're probably going to do it nice. No, thank you. I'm done. I'm full. I'm finished. You need to provide encouragement and you need to use at least two forms of encouragement. I'm going to give you three. You need to use two. The first is, are you sure you don't want just one more bite? Remember, being nice will get you further. So would you like just one more bite? Or for me, if you've got a connection with them. Um, the second form of encouragement is to offer something else. We've all had those days where you make something, you take a bite, and you're like, nope, not it. Not what I was looking for. Nope. And then you go get something else because it's your kitchen and you're allowed to do that. Um, or you just choke down what you made because you're not wanting to make something else. But we've all had those days. Well, what if your patient's having that day right now? It's not their kitchen. They don't have the ability to go make something else. So they may take two or three bites and, and say, nah, I'm done. I don't want any more. Well, they may still be hungry, but they're afraid to ask for something different. So by offering, can I get you something else from the kitchen? Maybe a sandwich or is there something else you'd, you'd like? A lot of times that opens the door and they, they can say, yeah, maybe some graham crackers would be nice. Hey, I'm getting them to eat. Let me go get some graham crackers for you. So the first is, are you sure you don't want just one more bite? The second is, can I get you something else from the kitchen? And the third, I always leave a patient with, let me know if you get hungry later because we do have some snacks here. So that way they know that food is available. Sometimes they won't ask because they don't think that you've got food in the area. They have to wait till the next meal. So I always try to let them know we've got food. If you, if you get hungry, let me know. I can run down and get you a sandwich anytime. Um, let them know what's available to them. Sure. Now, the thing about feeding <clears throat> is that we're going to document what they're eating. Okay. We're going to get to that in just a second. We're going to document the percentage. But if the patient is not eating much, we have to tell the nurse because that can be a sign of a lot of different things. Sure. Um, difficulties in digestion, uh, depression. Um, pain. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things that can cause a decrease in appetite. But if the patient is eating everything we're giving them and asking for more, that can also be a sign of problems. So we need to let the nurse know of anything that we're noticing that's on either end of the spectrum. They're not eating much or they're eating more than we're giving. Okay, make sense? All right. So <clears throat> let's talk about um, let's see here. <clears throat> okay. So let's talk about documentation. If you look at the documentation on page 75, right in the middle. You'll see that it's based on percentages. And again, if you want to look at page 121, I think it was in your booking, see a bigger, um, bigger form of it. But when we're talking about percentages of food, most feeding is going to be documented in percentages. How much did the patient eat? Well, to know that, we have to know what we started with. You always have to... Because if I tell you the patient ate the entire pudding cup, that sounds like 100%, right? Until you realize that it came with all of this too. If all they ate was the entire pudding cup, do they still eat 100%? No. So you have to figure out what we started with to figure out how much the patient ate. 
Okay. So if this is what we started with, the patient just kind of picked at it, that would be 25%. The patient ate half of it, which would be about 50%. The patient ate most of it, which would be 75%, or the patient ate all of it, 100%. Okay. So do you guys kind of see how that works? So on page 74 is a documentation activity. So let's look at the first column. At the bottom of the first column, you've got the starting meal. Three slices of bacon, two eggs, two toast, and peaches. That sounds good. So if I deliver that to the patient and I go pick it up and I get back an empty plate, how much did the patient eat? 100%, we like that. We don't have to report that to the nurse. Number two, out of the three slices of bacon, I got one and a half. Out of the two eggs, I got one. And out of the two slices of toast, I've got one. How much did the patient eat? Yeah, about half. Number three. How much did the patient eat on that plate? Yeah, about 75, a little bit left here and there. And then number four, they barely touched it. Yeah, barely touched it. You guys see how that works? Percentages? All right, now liquids for the test only are gonna be percentages for the test only. In a clinical setting, we don't use percentages for liquid. We actually usually measure hard numbers. Now in America, we use ounces. In medicine, we use mLs or cc's. That's the same thing, mLs and cc's, same thing. Um, so we have to learn how to convert. One ounce is worth 30 mLs. One ounce is 30 mLs. Now, luckily for us, little juice containers, like four ounce juice containers, it'll actually tell us on the label, four ounces, 120 cc's. So all you gotta do is read the label. Milk cartons, eight ounce milk cartons, it'll say eight ounces, 240 mLs. But water glasses, we're going to have to know how many ounces that water glass is. And this is something that you would find out during orientation. They will tell you, our water glasses here are six ounces. Our coffee cups here are eight ounces. They'll, they'll actually tell you. You have to remember that or write it down or whatever, because when we're doing intake and output, you need to know how many ounces does this coffee cup usually hold. And then you're going to convert that to mLs. So if you look at um, the bottom of the second column, you'll see six ounces of juice in a cup. If each ounce is worth 30 cc's, how many cc's is six ounces? 180. Eight ounces of milk, eight times 30 is 240. 12 ounces of coffee, that's a big coffee cup. <laughs> 12 ounces of coffee, how much would that be? 360. So at the end of your shift, you're actually going to add up all of those readings from the day to come up with a total per shift. This is called intake and output. So intake is everything that's gone into the patient. The nurse is going to keep track of any IVs or irrigations or things like that, things they do. But CNAs are going to keep track of what the patient has taken in orally and add it up. So if we add up 180, 240, and 360, if you add that up, it comes to 780, and that would be your total intake for the day. Okay, so then you would, it, that would be an estimate. So instead of six ounces, it would be, four, five, you know, yeah, you're going to guesstimate. Yeah. 
So we would use percentages to figure out the VMLs. Okay, good. Questions? It's a lot of material to cover for feeding. The skill itself is like three minutes. I mean, it's super quick. They, they, they give you nine, but the video takes like three. Um, super quick. But you do need to understand, um, my cords are here, yay. Um, <laughs> you do need to understand all of what I talked about for the written test. Remember I said today is the lectures are more about what you're going to find on the written. Just a question. Okay. It, well, we'll give you an answer still in a second, but uh, also in the work environment, sometimes they left with their own little pitchers and put them out. Water, water pitchers, yeah. We also give the idea of the milk batter application about 200 milligrams or not. Yes. Yeah, so. so can't go on over, can't fill up in 12 and a half years old. Right. Yes, so you would want to keep track. Usually, and I'm not going to give you a blanket statement, but usually if the patient can uh, take care of that themselves, we're not tracking. So we wouldn't have to measure intake and output. Usually if we're measuring intake and output, um, we're going to be filling the water pitchers. And it's just to make sure that because the patient's probably not taking in enough on their own. Um, we just wanna make sure they're not getting dehydrated. It's also a really good way for us to figure out kidney function. So most of your diabetic patients will be on in, intake and output because what goes in ultimately should come out. Within you know a, a, a small percentage, one to 200 cc's usually, um, because you do have some moisture loss through respiration, some moisture loss through digestion, but as a general rule, what goes in must come out. So um, if our kidneys aren't working well, the intake and output can help, help us notice that. Because if we have 2000 cc's going in, but I only got 800 out. Yeah, it's still in the patient somewhere, probably in their feet, because they'll start to swell. So as a nurse, I'm going to look at that pretty closely. Okay. But if the patient is ambulatory and taking care of all of their own, you know, um, hydration needs, we're probably not tracking it. Okay. Good. Questions? No? Okay. I'm going to show you this video because it's, um, it's got good close-ups and I have nothing here to feed you guys. Oh, see, Shimon has arrived. <laughs> okay. All right, so let me show you this video. Uh -oh. We don't need bed bath. So if you look, this is three minutes and 45 seconds. <laughs> you don't need nine minutes. Hi, Mr. Jones. My name is Kathy. I'm here to see you today. Would you like a snack? Yes, please. Okay, I'm going to go wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. Can I ask you to set up straight for me, please? Okay. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Jones, let me 
get your hand wipe, so that you can wipe your hand, and sit back. Thank you very much. You deserve it. Okay, can I offer you a clothing protector? Yes, please. Place this on your chest. Okay, it looks like we have pudding. How does that sound? Great. Very good. Can I offer you a drink before we get started? Please. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, are you ready? Yes. There you go. Do you have any plans for this afternoon? No. They're showing a movie on the big screen in the activity room. Would you like me to get more information on that for you? Yes, please. Okay. How does the pudding taste? Good. Very good. Ready for another? Yes. Can I offer you a drink? Would you like something to drink? Yes, please. Ready for another bite? Yes, please. Ready for another bite? I'm not sure what you want. Are you sure you wouldn't like just one more bite? I'm not sure what you want. Can I get you something else in the kitchen? No, thank you. Okay. Let me know if you get hungry later, and we'll get something to eat. We do have food available on the unit. Thank you. Let me place the napkin. Okay. I'll remove this clothing protector from you, and we're going to put this in just for you. I'm going to go take care of your tray. I'll be right back. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to place the tray back on your table. Is there anything else I can get for you? A magazine, perhaps? No, thank you. Your call light is within reach. Please let me know if you should need anything. I'm going to go wash my hands and document. Okay, thank you. After washing my hands, I'm going to document the amount of food that this patient ate. And the percentage of fluid they took in. Using my documentation form, I'll review the checks of my skill make any corrections, and tell the evaluator my skill is done. One check on <laughs> Me too. Remember that you will have one documentation skill. So you are going guaranteed to get one of these four. Pulse, respirations, feeding, or emptying the drainage bag, which we'll get to on Monday. But you will get one of those four. All right, questions on what we've gone over? You're going to have three physical skills to demonstrate. Um, yeah, I think it's been three for yeah a long time, but three skills that you have to demonstrate. Um, one of them will be a documentation skill. And then the other two, one of those is going to be an ADL skill. So things like bathing, dressing, grooming, so ADLs. The other one is going to be a mobility skill. So range of motion, ambulate, transfer, sideline position, that type of thing. So one ADL skill, one mobility skill, and one documentation skill. Yep. And that, but, but those are the three you know about. They're actually grading you on five. So the three skills that they give you on the care plan, you're going to do those in order, what, whatever's listed. And then the two skills that they didn't tell you about, one of those is hand washing. It's graded independently. And the other is indirect care or how well you communicate with the patient, how, um, how nice you are, your, kind of your bedside manner, for lack of another term. Okay. So that's graded independently as well. So you've got the three skills that are graded, hand washing and indirect care. And when you get your um, test results,
So this is the test result that you would get for your skills, okay? Um, at the bottom, it tells you some of the skills that you had, and that's going to bleed over till the next page. So this lists your five skills. And then the very last page, this tells you all of your deficiencies. So everything you did not get a check mark on for the test. Um, but your test report will tell you the five things, five skills that they're grading you on. And uh, hand washing and indirect care is always listed on there. No, it depends on what you miss. And it depends on how important that thing is that you missed. So uh, going back to mouth care, and this is um, what we did uh, the first day, we, the example that I gave. If you don't put the head of the bed up during mouth care, your patient could die because of aspiration. So that's going to count really, really big. It's going to count heavy. Um, forgetting to put a towel over the chest, nah, not as bad. You know, nobody's died from getting toothpaste on their clothing. So it's not going to count as much. So every step on here, this is why I have these up here. I refer to them all the time. So these are all the graded steps for the skills. These are the actual graded steps. This is, I mean, this is legit what they use. This is what they have in their hand that they check off. When you're looking at this, every single one of these has a number attached to it. You don't know the numbers. I don't know the numbers. Nobody knows. The evaluators don't know the numbers. It's an internal proprietary grading system that they use. It is not published. But each one of these steps has a number attached to it. And when the computer gets your deficiencies, that's what the computer does is adds up those numbers. And that's what the computer decides whether you pass or fail. So you might miss two or three or four small steps that don't really count against you too much and be okay. Or you can miss one step that has a huge weight to it and that one step is enough to put you over the edge. It's not lowering the bed. Right, right. And we've gone over mm -hmm. all of the things that I know would automatically fail you. It, it is. And that's, that's the whole thing, right? Because, you know, if you don't use enough tooth, toothpaste on the toothbrush, it's okay, right? If you don't um, dry the patient's mouth after brushing her teeth, eh, it's okay. But if you kill the patient, that's not okay. So everything that has a big weight to it is always going to be safety based. And those are the things that I stress in here. So um, if you remember um, wheelchair that we just went over, brakes are a huge deal because it's a safety issue. Um, yeah, lowering the bed is a huge deal. Uh, pulse and respiration, there's not a whole lot there that would automatically fail you. Even if you don't get the right number, it's okay. As long as you're following that care plan and counting for one full minute. Okay, so hand washing, so let me back up. You're, you get three skills. It's better to have visual aids. You get three skills. These are the, the care plans, right? So you get one of these cards and you're gonna do these three skills in the order listed. So the very first skill here is feeding the resident who's in a chair. Oh, that's good. <laughs> feeding a resident who's in a chair. So, because that's the first skill during your opening, knock, knock, knock. Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I'm here to give you a snack or feed you, whatever. Is that okay? I'm not going to close the privacy curtain. It's going to stay open, but
but I'm going to go over and physically wash my hands for real with soap and water because the evaluators are grading it. I'm going to feed the patient. At the end of the skill, I'll do my closing. Thank you very much, Ms. Jones. Is there anything else I can get for you? Here's your call light. Environment's clean. I'm going to go physically wash my hands. Now, sometime after that first skill, I don't know when, I have no idea when, but sometime the evaluators are going to tell me I can simulate hand washing from that point. Now, I can't simulate until the nurse tells me to. So I'm going to keep washing my hands. I may be washing my hands all three skills. It's a possibility because if they don't tell me, I don't simulate. But if they do tell me, and they should at some point, if they tell me, okay, you can simulate hand washing, simulate means say. So I'm going to, I'm not going to go to the sink. I'm not going to pantomime washing hands, but I am going to say out loud, I would wash my hands now. Or I have just washed my hands. <laughs> simulate means say in this case, okay? But we don't simulate until we're told to because if for some reason you're washing your hands during skill one and your mind gets distracted and you only lather for 19 seconds, you were so close. Oh my gosh, you were so close. But we can't count it because 20 seconds means 20 seconds, period. There is no fudging room in there. There's no wiggle room. It's either 20 or it's not. It's like me scratching a lottery ticket and saying, well, 19 is close to the number that wins. Shouldn't I get something for that? <laughs> it either wins or it doesn't, right? So you have a hand washing that didn't win. So they may let you... Wash your hands <laughs> on the second skill. <laughs> yeah, so they may just choose. It's, it's not that they're, they just may choose to grade a different hand washing. <laughs> okay, so they're, they're very fair. They really are. Everybody gives the evaluators a bad rap. They really do. You know, the evaluators often, um, everybody thinks of them as big, scary monsters, you know, because they hold your career in the palm of their hand. And that's, you know, that that's a lot of power. But understand that their goal is not to keep you out of nursing. Their goal is actually to get you in. We have a shortage. They know we have a shortage. And if you don't actively sabotage your own chances, you're going to walk out of there a winner. But you've got to know what they're looking for. You have to understand the importance of the care plan. You've got to understand safety. And the biggest thing is we don't want to put grandma at risk. If you're doing something in the test that is ultimately going to put grandma at risk when there's nobody else in the room, right? Because you're on your best behavior during the test. You're doing everything the right way during the, because you know you're being graded. But if you're doing something so scary during the test, when you're out there on your own in grandma's room with nobody looking over your shoulder, are we putting grandma in jeopardy? That's what they're looking at here. Okay. It's not nitpicky, it's not designed to, make you make your life difficult it's all about can i keep grandma safe if i let this person become a cna is grandma's life out there going to be put in jeopardy does that make sense that's their focus so they don't want to fail you they really don't they want you to pass they need you to pass so just don't do anything that's like a red flag. No. <laughs> you know, the three-legged race is good on picnics. 
<laughs> not in a clinical setting. So, um, think, you know, things that would trip you up. So let's kind of go through this really quickly, okay? So hand washing, not washing for 20 seconds, that's going to trip you up. Not using enough soap, that's going to trip you up. Um, for, well, let me go down the list here so I don't miss any. Um, let's talk about mouth care. So things that are automatic fails on mouth care, not putting the head of the bed up. Um, touching a lot of things with those gloves and then putting those gloves in somebody else's mouth right? I wouldn't want those gloves in my mouth. So, you know, that, that's why we have a rule for that. The first thing our gloves should touch is the patient. So everything I'm about to say, right, because we're going to review these real quick, but everything I'm about to say, that's where I created these rules from. All of these rules that we keep going over and over and over and over, and you're sick of hearing by now, all of those rules are designed to help you remember a checkpoint, okay? These are all mine. I created these and I created them to help you during testing because they're short, they're easy to remember. And I, all I have to do is trigger you. Clean rolls toward me. You will never forget that. It's short and it's easily triggered. So when you're in the testing center, you're gonna hear me in your head on purpose. Don't ignore me because I'm trying to get you to pass. You don't even have to tell them. Yeah, you should not talk to the evaluators much. Everything should be between you and the patient. That's what they're grading right? They have no bearing in your life at all. They're a fly on the wall over here, but you shouldn't. So if I'm in a clinical setting and I've got some gloves on, I'm touching a whole bunch of stuff and I look at the gloves and go, oh, they got to go in your mouth. Oops. Let me get some clean gloves. <laughs> I'm going to take them off and put some clean gloves on. And my patient's now happy because I'm, you know, verbalizing to them what I'm doing. Um, so yeah, talk to the patient. If you've got to start over on a skill, so let's say you're measuring pulse and you just totally lost the count, which happens. Um, don't tell the evaluator. They're smart cookies. They'll keep up. Trust me. They will. Don't tell them. Tell the patient. They're the ones that need to know. Oops, I lost count. I must be hungry or something. <laughs> I'm going to start again. Ready, start. Patient's good. Evaluators will keep up. Okay. So, um, Dressing a resident with a weak arm. How could we fail dressing a resident with a weak arm? Well, if you elevate the bed to a comfortable working height and don't put it back down, that's an automatic fail, right? Right, so we know we have to undress the strong arm first because that minimizes motion, right? They, they don't have to move a whole lot if the gown is just sliding right off that weak arm. Um, but if we do it the other way, and we make that weaker arm do all the work, that could be detrimental to grandma, couldn't it? Could injure them or cause them pain. So that is gonna be weighted heavy. If you break the mannequin. <laughs> guys, you're laughing, right? You're laughing. Do you say, do normal feet do this? No. That is broken. That is a steel cable that connects that. And it is broken. So tell me how much force somebody had to use to break a steel cable. If you break the mannequin, you fail the test. Not because you broke the mannequin. It has nothing to do with it. But if you broke a mannequin, a steel cable, you would have broken the body that you're doing this on. They, they know because they, they know the difference. Yeah, they know the difference. Um, for instance, this one, this one is still attached. See how it doesn't go all the way around, right? This is like a real person. It, it stops. So how much force would I need to 
break it, right? Guys, clearly, th this mannequin does not go anywhere. She's not really mobile. I know the bottom of her feet are dirty, so I think she might be walking around, but I, I haven't caught her yet, right? Somebody broke this mannequin while dressing. Absolutely. That's why I bring it up. Okay. Somebody broke this mannequin while dressing. Somebody broke uh, the arm of the other one. It's a PVC pipe, a, a one and a half inch PVC pipe in there. Those things do not break easily. And it broke because they were trying to bend the arm in an unnatural way to get it in the sleeve. Well, if you're bending a mannequin's arm unnaturally, you would be bending a human's arm unnaturally, right? So don't break the mannequin because you would definitely break a human, definitely. Does that make sense? Okay, the rest of the steps, they're nice. You know, keep the patient covered, that's nice. Keep some warm. Um, lift from below with a flat palm, that's nice. And it could cause injury if you didn't, but they're not going to die, right? But those steps, breaking the mannequin, undressing the weak arm first and dressing the, you know, doing it the opposite way could injure the patient in a serious way. Does that make sense? Okay. So uh, pulse, how do you fail pulse? Well, it's really hard to fail pulse. I mean... If you don't count for one full minute, you will fail. That's pretty much the one thing that will fail you on pulse. The care plan says one full minute. And what do we follow? The care plan. So that's why I stress the care plan, 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 and the care plan. Because the number one way to fail these skills is to not follow the care plan. That's simple. Because not following the care plan puts the patient at risk hand and nail care i don't even know if there are i don't think that there are any automatic fails on hand and nail care i don't think there's any you would have to do multiple things wrong and get that to add up yeah possibly because that causes injury um, you know, not letting them check the water temperature, that's going to be a deficiency, but it's not going to fail you automatically. Right. Not wiping off the lotion is a deficiency, but it's not an automatic fail. But you put those two together, nah, now we're not really looking at grandma too close, right? You know, we're, we're not really doing things for grandma's benefit. So you'd have to have several things that uh went together for that good um same thing with foot care no automatic well i'm sorry there is one if you don't put the shoe on at the end of foot care why would that be important okay and if the feet hit the floor we talk about there so i have a rule for that Anything that's an automatic fail, I guarantee you it's up on this board somewhere. Okay. Um, making an occupied bed. If you do not keep the patient in the middle of the bed, it's an automatic fail. So if you get them to roll and they're on the edge of the bed, that's an automatic fail. So what do we have to do before they roll? Scoot. We have a whole banner for that. Scoot toward me and roll away. Good. Um, putting the linens on, directly on the floor is an automatic fail. Why? Yep, that's right. So we don't put any linens, clean or dirty, on the floor. So we have a whole rule for that. Um, supported sideline position. Again, the patient must be in the middle of the bed. If you turn them and they're too close to the edge of the bed, it's a, that's an automatic fail. So, but if you catch it, so let's say you turn the patient and you get the pillows all in place and 
and you step back and you look and you go, ooh, that doesn't look quite right. Address it. Address it, get them back in the middle of the bed and you're fine, but don't end with them close to the edge. Okay. Um, let's see here, bedpan. So for bedpan, there are a couple of things that can fail you on this that are like big triggers, okay? Number one, not putting the head of the bed up. Now, this really isn't much of a safety issue, but it really is kind of big on the gross meter issue because they can't go if their pelvis is raised, but if they do, it's going to go right into their hair. And that's just really high on the gross meter, right? So it's not an automatic fail, but it is a big point. So one other small thing with it and you're done. Okay. Um, all, the, all the other steps of bedpan are kind of sort of important, like putting a chucks under the bedpan because of sloshing. That's important. Um, making sure you're dumping the bedpan in the toilet. That's important making sure they're covered with a sheet or a privacy blanket, that's important. So two of those together would be detrimental, okay? But anyone alone wouldn't necessarily fail you, okay? Um, range of motion shoulder. Range of motions are super hard to fail, super hard to fail as long as you're following the care plan. So if you go in and you, uh, you um, work on the wrong body part, you will fail. Why? That's right, that's right. There's a reason that it's not on the care plan. So, it shows you don't understand what a care plan is. And so, okay, let me tell you this real quick. Because the very first thing I told you guys in this class is the care plan, right? The entire class is built on the, every skill that we learn, we go over the, right? I, I, I beat it into you. It doesn't, to you, it, it, it wouldn't even enter your mind to not, not at least acknowledge the care plan or not, you, at least you know what the care plan is. Okay, in your blue books, open to the index in the back of your blue book, if you have your blue book with you, I want to show you something that is going to be absolutely, it's going to blow your mind. Okay. Okay, so turn to page 263 in your blue book. And look up care plan. Now, we've just determined that care plan is what we go by, right? It is the foundation of everything we do. I can't tell you a skill without talking about the care plan, right? How many pages in this blue book is a care plan on? One. And it's even worse than that. It only has one paragraph. In this entire book, one paragraph about the care plan. One. That should scare you because the way that I taught you, you're now going, oh, well, wait a minute. So what else is in this book? Because everything we do is the care plan and yet it's not covered in the book. So most of the people that are testing guys do not have the knowledge you have. Yes. 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 
friends with the nurse, grabbed their instruction and ran away and be like, oh, okay, I got to do it this way. Without <laughs> double checking. I, I'm one of those big people. I like to double check my work. So, yeah, the nurse can tell me one thing. I'll still go read the plan. So, I know I know. <laughs> and they do match and nothing off. Right. So you need to understand that most of the people that are going to test, most of the people you're testing with, you're going to get partnered up with somebody that did not go to this class. They may have watched a video. It may have been my video on transferring a patient out of bed and into a wheelchair. They now know how to transfer, but they don't know when that's appropriate or how to adjust it for the patient that they're working on. They know how to do it one way. And they're going to be testing with you. So I need you to understand that the way you've been taught makes total sense to you. It, it, to you, it wouldn't dawn on you that CNA programs can be taught any other way because we understand the importance of the care plan in what we do. But most of the other people that you're going to be testing with do not have that level of knowledge. And that's what's being tested. You guys understand that? The state knows that page seven of the blue book is the only place that care plan is mentioned. They know that. So it's up to the instructor to explain the importance of the care plan, which I do on day one and day two and day three and day four. And, <laughs> and by the time we're halfway through, you're singing <laughs> along, right? So the test is there to weed out those that are gonna put grandma in jeopardy, not so much with what they do, but more with what they know or don't know. So when I say the test is all about following the care plan, I mean it. You guys are taking that very literally. I mean, you're, you're reading like the words and you're following the words. And I need you to do that because that's important. But I need you to take a step back and see bigger picture. They're just seeing if anybody understands what this thing is. Do you have a clue? I mean, because most people will read the title, feed the resident in a chair, and they'll go. Oh, I'll figure this out. I'll feed somebody. They don't read that they're in an inappropriate position for eating. They don't understand how important that is. The way that I've taught you, it is virtually impossible for you to fail the test. Because, <laughs> because you're... Now, the problem with that is that you're partnered up with somebody you don't know, somebody that did not go here. And you're partnered up with that individual and they're going to be doing their skills on you. And you're going to be like. <laughs> no, you can't make googly eyes. You can't resist. You can't give them any signals. I mean, you, you, you have to just be, yes, yes. So if you get one that's really blonde and doesn't know the head from a hole in the ground, do you have to sit there with a straight face? Like, why? Gotta try. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta try. But you don't want to say, ooh, what's the plan? Because even if you did say, okay, first of all, you're going to get disqualified because you can't help somebody else test, right? So first of all, you get disqualified. But even if you did say that, oh my gosh, read the care plan. They're not going to have a clue what that care plan actually is. Yeah. What? Yeah. What, what do you want me to do here? So I teach this way on purpose because it's going to help you on the test. It's going to definitely help you in your clinical setting. It's going to keep all of the grandmas out there safe from you. So I teach this way on purpose, but you need to understand that I am unique in how I teach this. I developed this whole system for you. 
but this is why I'm now live streaming it. Okay. Because I'm only one person in one class, but we really need more CNAs out there that understand how this thing works. Not just how to transfer a patient out of bed or how to do range of motion on this particular patient. <laughs> we need to understand how the whole thing works. And when you learn it this way, man, you're caught up in the little, little steps. You're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I forgot to tell them who I was. No big deal. Did you follow the care plan? <laughs> Did you? If you follow the care plan, we're all happy. Okay. Big picture. Big picture. Yes, they're going to look at the little steps, but big picture is what we're looking at here. Okay. That's what would fail you. So moving on down here, um, denture care, what would fail you is not wearing gloves when you're touching the dentures because who wants that ooey gooey on your hands, but who wants what's on your hands on their dentures, right? So that's a big deal. Ambulate with a gate belt. Well, there's a lot of things on that skill that could fail you, right? Um, gate belt around you and the patient would be number one. <laughs> But when it comes to ambulate, that is 100% a safety skill. Every single step in that skill is safety. And we know safety counts pretty big. So that one, you really want to make sure that you're practicing and you understand the steps because that one can get you, okay? All of the steps are important. Partial bed bath, man, you're washing a body face to waist, giving a back rub. If you remember the rules here, use a privacy blanket, don't get the bed wet, whatever you wash or rinse, whatever you rinse, you dry. So all of our rules, that checks off every single one of the, the checklists, every one. So I have a fun activity that I'm going to be doing with you on the last day. And I'm going to give you a checklist. And you're going to with the, the banners, you're going to see if that checkpoint is covered in one of our rules. And you're going to see that every, this is what you're going to be graded on. This is the checklist that's used with your grading. And you are going to determine with your own eyes that every single checkpoint is covered by a rule. And if you just follow the rules, you can't fail. You can't. Okay. So that's something we'll do on the last day. Um, and then transfer, we talked about brakes being important for transfer and getting that wheelchair close enough because the patient can't take a step. So it's following the care plan. Again, it's that care plan, that care plan, that care plan. And when I actually looked in the blue book, and I realized that it's only mentioned in one paragraph, that was a huge wake up call for me. And you guys probably didn't even re realize that until I pointed it out. No. You've read that that blue book. Yeah, because that was actually, when you said it was only on page seven and a half. One paragraph. One paragraph. I was actually trying to go back through all the other chapters to see if it was mentioned anywhere else, and I can't remember it. Mm -mm. Nope. Nope. So for something that's the entire foundation of what we do, you would think it would warrant. More than just a paragraph? Yeah. All right, so let's go ahead and take a break. Come back at five till, and we're going to go over peri care. Okay, please remember that the um, microphone is still on in this room. Yes, I caught that Monday when somebody was on their phone talking. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm going to turn the microphone off, but it still picks up the um, computer microphone latent. So please remember that.